Okay. All right. All right. Welcome back. Uh, so our next speaker is Jen Feng Liu uh, from Duke. Uh, he's actually uh, one of more uh, of our most serious uh, uh, remote participants for the semester. And uh, you always see his name in those Zoom meetings. So he's going to talk to you about uh, hypocursive sampling uh, dynamics. Take it away, Jen Feng. Thanks a lot for the organizers for putting together such a nice workshop and for the kind invitation. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, I plan to come in October, uh, though, so that um, to meet you guys in person and to discuss. And um, so what I'm going to talk about today is about some of our recent works on understanding the convergence, I mean, analysis for hypocoercive sampling dynamics. I don't think this word has appeared yet in the workshop, but I mean, it's actually something uh, familiar to many of you. Um, I should mention that this is a, a series of work and joined with my former student, Yu Cao and Li Han Wang. And Li Han is actually in the workshop so that uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask him during the break. Okay, so um, I guess everyone here is, uh, I mean, we're all here to talk about sampling so that I can just uh, basically skip these slides, but just to give you some ideas of where we come from so that we want to understand the convergence rate and asymptotic variance, and so that to determine the, uh, the efficiency of MCMC sampling algorithms, okay? And now our purpose here, I mean, so for today is to consider sampling problems in high dimensional space with continuous state variables. So it's, uh, so it's X and in RD. So it's a, it's a full uh, space sampling problem and will be mostly uh, focused on uh, strongly log concave distributions while some of the results actually apply in more general cases. And so for this case, as we have seen uh, during the workshop and also during tutorial that a common design principle of sampler, MCMC samplers is to first start with a continuous time Markov process and then do a time discretization. Perhaps the most famous example for that is the overdamped Langevin dynamics, or I mean in statistics machine learning literature known as the Langevin dynamics. Uh, so the, it's, the dynamics is just this, so it's like a random noise perturbed gradient flow. Uh, under the potential U. And one can uh, show that, I mean, so this is the uh, invariant measure of the dynamics. And I mean, one can use this, I mean, as a sampling dynamics for the Gibbs measure. And as always, we are hoping for like fast convergence of the sampling dynamics to equilibrium. And for this case, it's actually sort of easy to see. And for that, I mean, so the focus of my talk or the techniques that we'll be discussing in this talk is actually PD technique. So I also choose this topic to connect to, I mean, two themes of this program. So um, one way to analyze this is to write down the back home, uh, backward chromograph equation associated with the SDE. So this describes the evolution of observable. If you start with uh, some observable H, H0, and if you flow the time to infinity, and the solution will converge to a constant and it converge to expectation of the observable H0, so which is what we want to sample. And now, so the long-time behavior of the sampling dynamics or the overdamped Langevin dynamics is well understood. And there are many uh, approaches to do that, but one uh, easy approach is through the Poincaré inequality. So if the potential, uh, if the distribution satisfy a Poincaré inequality in this type, so that you bound the variance of uh, the distribution in terms of the gradient of H squared with a Poincaré constant uh, M, and so then uh, we can we know that it will exponentially converge. Okay, and just as an example that so if your potential is m strongly convex means that hessian of the potential is bounded from below by m, then it satisfies the I mean the, the distribution satisfies the Poincaré inequality with this uh, constant m here. Okay, and so I guess uh, it's sort of familiar to everyone that under the assumption of Poincaré. Uh, I mean, the sampling dynamics converges exponentially with the rate given by the Poincaré constant in L2. Okay. And I mean, this is a simple proof. I mean, it's actually a one-line proof for this. It's uh, the standard energy method. You multiply the PDE on the left-hand side by H and then take a time derivative. Okay. So I hope this is clear so far. Okay. So just as an introduction of what we know for the uh, overdamped case or it's the reversible case. Okay. So the focus of our uh, kind of consideration of work is really try to understand, I mean, the uh, quantitative convergence rate for the uh, hypocoercive cases, or in other words, uh, the other words for that is a non-reversible sampling dynamics. 
And the perhaps the most famous example, at least to this audience, is the so-called underdamp laundry band dynamics or the kinetic laundry band dynamics, which I mean, you can, uh, this is sort of related with the uh, HMC, as we also see later. Uh, but I mean, so this part is the Hamiltonian dynamics. So the position, uh, the time derivative of position is given by the velocity. And the time derivative of velocity is given by the force, which consists of three parts. So one is the gradient part, which is similar to the overdamped case before. And so that this consists of the Hamiltonian part of the dynamics. And then we have the noise and fluctu uh, dissipations. Okay, where this uh, the only parameter here, I mean, I kind of non-dimensionalize so that the only parameter is the gamma, which is the friction parameter, physically speaking. Okay, and I mean, the reason that this is called underdamped laundry band dynamics, and I mean, or the actually in physics is usually just known as laundry band dynamics, is because that if you send the friction parameter to infinity and the rescale time properly, then it will actually converge to the overdamped dynamics. And one can also show that using either PDE or to check, I mean, the generator, for example, that the invariant measure for this laundry band dynamics is given by product measure, where in the variable X is just the Gibbs measure that we want to sample, and in the V is a Gaussian measure. So now we try to understand the, uh, the convergence rate for this laundry band dynamics. I mean, the purpose of that is, I mean, hopefully, once we understand the convergence of the continuous dynamics, then we can uh, think about time disquisitions and getting the estimate for the discrete uh, sampling MCMC samplers. And as before, I mean, kind of parallel to the overdamped case, uh, one natural approach is to think about the PDE analog, I mean, of um, the analog of the backward microbial equation that we have seen before, or focal function equation. And in this case, for the kinetic laundry van dynamics, the corresponding uh, chromograph equation is given by this. I mean, where the generator consists of two parts. So one is the Hamiltonian part, which is actually non reversible because this is kind of a rotation. If you think about what this action is on the phase space. And the other part is the fluctuation dissipation part, which consists of the noise and also dissipation of the velocity. And this part is actually reversible. And I mean, this, I mean, if you think about, if you neglect say for a moment that I neglect this part and just think about dynamics in V, this is actually can be viewed as overdamped dynamics for the Gaussian potential. So, and of course, I mean, once you write down a generator, you can check explicitly that the invariant measure is given by what I claim to be, so which is the row infinity. So now the question is that, I mean, so if we think about the convergence rate of overdamped, as we said before, that um, if you think about convergence rate in chi square or in L2, uh, the rate is given by M, which is the Poincare constant of the measure. So what's the case of the underdamped case? Okay. So this is actually the question that we started asking ourselves a couple of years ago. And so if there was any, I mean, so by you think in some sense, you are kind of augmenting the state space by introducing these auxiliary variables, uh, which is the velocity from a physical point of view. And the question is whether that helps. And indeed it helps. And this is the theorem that we proved a couple of years ago. Uh, so under some technical assumptions, what one can show is that the, uh, in L2, the sampling dynamics actually converges exponentially with a rate by lambda, which is given explicitly by this formula, where, I mean, so the gamma is the friction parameter uh, that we have, we have in the dynamics, and M is the Poincare constant of the, uh, of the Gibbs measure that you want to sample, I mean, uh, related with this U. For example, if, I mean, if we know what M is, and we can choose gamma to optimize this rate, and if you choose gamma, if you choose gamma proportional to the square root of M, then the rate that you will get is the square root of M. And let me just mention that we have uh, results of the convergence rate analysis for more general cases, but I'm going to focus on this particular case here, which is, uh, I mean, you can think of it as strongly log concave case, okay, and where this M is really the strong log concave uh, parameter. Okay, so let me make a couple of remarks. So first of all, I mean, so this is, I mean, if we simplify the situation by setting that the average of the observable is equal to zero, and this is just the summary of the results so that it exponentially converges in L2 in the dual space of the observable, right? I mean, with the rate, which is the square root of M, okay? And by the way, I mean, so this, we are thinking, taking the perspective of observable here, but if you're thinking in terms of the probability measure, 
of the forward equation, this means that the chi-square divergence converges uh, with this rate. Okay. And uh, first of all, if you compare with the overdamped decay dynamics, uh, remember that overdamped dynamics has uh, the exponential rate, but with, uh, with a worse constant. Okay, I mean, thinking about case, we are always thinking about case where M is small, so that this is uh, slower than this. Okay, so indeed you see that the underdamped Langevin actually accelerates the convergence. And also it's not hard to check that this uh, root M dependence I mean, of the convergence rate is optimal uh, because you can take U to be just a simple Gaussian and you, I mean, by explicit calculation of uh, what's happening of a Gaussian measure on the dynamics, you can check that this is uh, the optimal rate. You cannot get anything better than this. And also, I mean, there are many techniques available to get quantitative estimate for the convergence rate for Langevin. And as far as, as we know that this is only a technique giving you root M uh, up to date, okay? And also, I mean, because we have showed the convergence in chi-square, so this also implies the convergence in relative entropy and total variation, which are all in root M. Okay, any questions for this before I move on? Just making sure that uh, I'm not, I'm still connected. So uh, one thing that I want to uh, mention and actually uh, I think bring to attention of this community is that, I mean, so oftentimes we spend a lot of time to analyze uh, MALA or uh, HMC type of algorithm, but actually there are many interesting sampling algorithms out there and recently proposed by statisticians and applied mathematicians. And I feel they actually worth considerations by the community trying to, especially in the CS community, trying to establish uh, non-symptotic bonds. So for that purpose, actually, I will spend some time trying to introduce you some new dynamics maybe, so which at, as far as I see have, haven't been covered in this uh, program. So, I mean, there was a new family of sampling dynamics called piecewise deterministic Markov process, or PDMP for short. And so the, their kind of uh, behavior is a bit like, uh, so you have a random clock, which is, uh, a, kind of, you can think of it as Poisson clock. And uh, I mean, besides, uh, between the clock wins, okay, besides, uh, and so that dynamics just follow some deterministic uh, trajectory. So that's why it's called the deterministic Markov process. So piece, um, but it's piecewise, so that when the random clock I mean, happens and then it does something and to, to ensure that you're actually sampling the correct measure. One of the example that is perhaps uh, familiar uh, because it's very related with HMC, so it's the randomized HMC algorithm, okay? So, uh, so it's almost the same as the standard HMC, but instead of the standard HMC where you run the Hamilton dynamics for a fixed duration of time, capital T, and then you redraw the velocity, so here, what you do is that you run the Hamiltonian dynamics, uh, but you, at the same time, you have a clock which ring at a rate that is gamma. And when the Poisson clock rings, what you do is that you just redraw the velocity according to a Gaussian uh, distribution. So it is the Hamiltonian HMC algorithm, but for the time duration T, which follows a Poisson uh, exponential uh, random variable with rate which is given by gamma. I hope this is clear. And now this is one of the example of the uh, PDMP uh, dynamics, but then there are more, I mean, many more recent uh, examples. So one of the, uh, I mean, kind of, I will introduce two of the uh, kind of more popular ones that is kind of used these days. So one is so-called zigzag sampler. So uh, this dynamics is actually quite interesting to some extent. And what it does is that, I mean, so forget about this part first. So only I mean, forget about this part first and only look at this, okay? So if the dynamics, if this is my only part of my generator, then what the dynamics, uh, I mean, goes is just a straight line. So what this says, I mean, in terms of the ODE, is just that the X dot is equal to V. So with a, given, with a fixed velocity, the particle just uh, flies in the, in the straight line. So as you can see from, uh, from the picture here, maybe uh, not large enough, I'm not sure how it views in, in person, but you can see that this follows a straight trajectory. And then it, I mean, these, there, were several, there were several Poisson clocks, my wing, and when it wings, it does a couple of things. So if this Poisson clock wins, this part of the generator, what it does is just that it redraw the velocity as a Gaussian random variable. And if only with this, then there is no reason that this would sample the correct measure that, uh, that we want, which is the Gibbs one, which is the Gibbs measure. And then you add on top of this Poisson clock, a, I mean, a bunch of another Poisson clocks, which is, I mean, the number is given by the dimension of the problem. 
And for this Poisson clock, what you do is that whenever they ring, you flip the velocity in that direction. So imagine that you are flying in this direction. If, I mean, previously, I mean, as we, as we said, we always go a straight line, okay? And whenever the person, I mean, one of the person clock rings, and what you do is just that you flip the velocity in that direction, so which is this direction that we're talking about, okay? You flip the velocity, so that's, that's a reflection, and you go to that, I mean, you follow the trajectory in that uh, new direction. So as you can see also in the picture here that you go up here, and then one clock rings, I mean, you flip the velocity direction in X1 and you go back there and then you, you're going like this, okay? And then you pick the rate of this flipping of the directions according to the partial derivative related with partial derivative of potential multiplied by the velocity. And then you can check that actually for this generator. I mean, you can check that this L star acting on the, uh, the row infinity before is actually equal to zero, which means that the invariant measure of this sampling dynamics is agrees with what we want to sample. Okay, so this is known as zigzag sampler introduced in 2019. And there was a very similar uh, kind of related sampler, uh, which is called bouncy particle, uh, which is slightly introduced slightly earlier in the physics literature and also picked up uh, by, uh, in the machine learning literature later on, uh, which is very similar so that you follow some straight lines. And then when the clock wins, you either withdraw the velocity from a Gaussian or in this case, you flip, but not according to a coordinate plane, you flip according to the gradient of U, so the level set of the potential functions. Okay, and so this is a, like a cartoon that uh, uh, shows the trajectory of this um, under the bouncy particle process. Okay, and one advantage that why people like these things is that, I mean, so oftentimes we know that if we have a lot of data that we need to uh, estimate the gradient using some stochastic gradient estimations, and now if you use a long event sampler or using HMC and you're not using the accurate gradient, uh, then that will induce bias. Uh, but one nice properties of the zigzag of the bouncy particle samplers is that even with the uh, stochastic gradient, they could be made unbiased. Okay, so uh, I'm not going into details of these things and also applications, but if in, I mean, I have been uh, collaborating with some statisticians at Duke on these things. And if you're interested, we can talk more afterwards. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, so in the pre can you come back to the previous slide for a sec? Sure. Uh, okay, I see. So I was looking for where uh, grad you was. So you only need the coordinates of the of uh, of you. Okay. And yeah, exactly. So this is actually a part we'll come back to. So it's a bit like a coordinate algorithm that Ching yeah. uh, discussed earlier in the workshop, and it's actually for each bounce you only need partial derivative. Okay. The other question that I have is, could you remind us what the role of gamma is in the in the discrete time uh, HMC? Because you only discussed the continuous time HMC, and so gamma. One, was yeah, one over gamma is kind of like t, so okay. which is the duration of the HMC at uh, the Hamiltonian trajectory on average. Okay, thanks. So the small, I mean, in other words, the small gamma is that you are running the Hamiltonian dynamics for longer before we draw the sample, uh, we draw the velocity. Any expectation the gamma plays the same role, right? For those yes, two. exactly. All right, thanks. I mean, the purpose of the randomized HMC, by the way, is to actually uh, the, I mean, kill the resonance that could happen if you run the, uh, the gamma at a fixed interval. So that, I mean, so you may run into troubles over that. So that's, I mean, that's, I mean, and also for an analysis on a continuous level, it's slightly easier. I mean, to formulate the problem this way. Okay. So now, I mean, so we have results, I mean, which is actually follows from a similar analysis framework uh, as the Langevin dynamics for the quantitative convergence rate for these dynamics as well. Um, so, let me, I mean, we're summarizing the results of these PDMPs on this single page. And the take home message, I guess, is that for the randomized HMC, uh, as you can imagine, because it's so connected with Langevin dynamics and actually on the continuous level, the convergence rate is the same. Oh, by the way, I should mention that when I write O, I mean, so everything I implied is, uh, is, I mean, is absolute constant so that there was nothing dimension dependent of anything like that hidden in the O variables. Okay, so that all these things are dimension independent except the last one. And now for zigzag, uh, it's deteriorated a little bit by the condition number where the L is, I mean, so for simplicity here, we assume that the, uh, the gradient U is smooth so that the hashing is bounded from above by L and bounded from below by small m. So that this is the condition number that you can view. And which is sort of reasonable because, I mean, as you can uh, see that in the zigzag, because the algorithm 
design is designed knowing explicitly to call it planes. So that if you kind of uh, uh, make a, the potential much skewed, and because the algorithm does not know that and has, I mean, it's not adaptive to that, so that it will suffer from a condition number. Okay, I mean, you can make it more adaptive, but I mean, we're talking about the originals exactly. And for BPS, I mean, the, we do not know whether it's sharp or not, but I mean, the best we can prove is that it will be deteriorated by root of D uh, in the, in the uh, convergence rate. And I mean, as far as we know that all these uh, convergence rates are state of art uh, as of today. Okay. So of course, I mean, many of the audience here are interested in algorithms rather than PD analysis. So that, I mean, as just a- uh, Sorry, sorry to interrupt again. Jim, yes. Just one more question. So those previous results, again, this is for like exact uh, simulation of the Hamiltonian dynamics, for example, for RHMC, you're assuming that you have exact Hamiltonian dynamics in between two uh, clocks? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that, I mean, we are talking about PD results here and I'm, com I'm, I'm coming to the algorithm. Okay. Just all right. Thank side. you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so all these are continuous uh, time results all for PDs or for the SD itself. Okay. So now let's come to the algorithms. And the zigzag sampler, I mean, and one advantage, and it's also very similarly for bouncy particle samplers, but I'm going to focus on the zigzag sampler. And, and I mean, the reason, one reason is because we can obtain the slightly better rate here, okay? And one advantage for that is that you actually do not make any disposition error because the only dynamics that you need to integrate is as simple as this, right? So it's just a straight line. And so unlike uh, Hamiltonian dynamics or long demand that we need to discretize it and make errors, I mean, so in principle, you can I mean, simulate this exactly, okay? Of course, there is no free lunch. And whereas the price, the price is actually, you need to pay the price to simulate the Poisson process. And remember that for zigzag process, what do we have a generator is something like, I mean, we sum over each directions, and then there will be something that is VI and a partial derivative of U in that direction. So this is the rate, okay? And to sample, to sample a Poisson uh, clock, with this rate. So if you do it naively, then this will be a nightmare because what you need to do is that you need to integrate this along the trajectory and then, uh, I mean, kind of do a transformation of the exponential random variable, uh, which is, I mean, not, I mean, which is unpractical and then you're also making errors. And one way to do that, oh, actually there is a generator here. One way to do that is that you introduce an upper bound for these things so that if you can simulate a Poisson process with, with a rate that is higher, that is guaranteed to be higher than any, I mean, of the rate that you occur in the inhomogeneous Poisson process, then you can simulate the Poisson process with a larger rate and then do a acceptance rejection afterwards, okay? To get the correct exact, I mean, this is kind of like a rejection sampling, uh, but for the Poisson process and to get exact simulation for, uh, for the inhomogeneous Poisson process and this is known in the literature called Poisson thinning. And for that, what you need to do is to get a uniform upper bound for this rate, okay? Now, I mean, this, I mean, in general, this is a hard question, right? Because, I mean, this depends on your knowledge of the, what the potential look like. But if you assume that we're in the setting of strongly log concave distributions with, uh, which, I mean, with known parameters of the uh, Lipschitz constant and the strongly uh, convex in, uh, convexity parameters, then that is possible. I mean, because I mean, this is just a gradient, right? So you can bound it by using the Lipschitz constant of the gradient, okay? And so in that context, okay, if you have a strong log concave and then you can come up with a upper bound using the, uh, using the potential and using the uh, L of the Lipschitz constant of potential, and then we'll give you a practical algorithm, okay? And the algorithm that we analyzed the complexity, I mean, together with Lihan uh, last year, I mean, for the zigzag sampler. And what we can prove is the following. So if you assume that the potential is strongly con uh, convex and with condition number kappa, okay? And we have to assume a warm start assumption that the chi-square, I mean, the reason that we have chi-square is because on the PD level, all our convergence results are for chi-square. Okay, so it's, it's L2 convergence. So that, I mean, so for the warmness, we also need to assume chi-square. And for the chi-square of initial distribution with back to target, is bounded by something like exponential d. If it's exponential d, then it's not warmness. But unfortunately, we need to have a log d here. Okay, so which is which make it uh, not a feasible start. Okay, and under this assumption, and also if you do not acquire like a very, very extremely high precision, 
And the reason for both of this and that is because we cannot run this process for extremely long time. I mean, before some disaster may happen because I mean, everything is random. So we need to control the wrong time. Okay, I mean, the total, I mean, total time of the sampling dynamics, uh, which comes into play here. Okay, then with these two assumptions, then with, I mean, but this is really mild because this is exponentially small indeed. Okay, but this is a, uh, this is a restriction to the, our starting point. Then with high probability, the zigzag sampler would output a random variable that was error is smaller than epsilon. And the query that we need in terms of partial derivatives is d to the three half times kappa square and everything else is log, uh, poly log, okay? And I mean, here, all, I mean, all these uh, constants that we didn't mention are absolute constants, okay? So, I mean, by the way, I mean, I should mention that this is the number of partial derivatives, which is related with the question asked uh, before, so that uh, when each bouncing uh, event occur, we need to do a exception rejection and that only use the partial derivative in the six sampler. So if you think that the evaluation of the partial derivative is one over D cheaper than the evaluation of the gradient, then effectively the cost of the sampler is uh, root D times kappa square. So of course, I mean, this, uh, you, you may want to compare this with uh, some of the recent works that we hear in the workshop and also uh, Yuan Su will talk about their work after me, I think. Um, so where they get, uh, for Mala, I mean, we can we should compare with Mala because we're in a high accuracy regime. So our uh, epsilon dependence is poly log. And in Mala, they were able to get d root half and times kappa complexity. But I should comment that their warmness, uh, warm start assumption is much stronger than ours uh, because their, almost, uh, their warm start assumption is constant uh, while we are like exponential d divided by log d. Hi, uh, uh, John Fung, I wanted to ask a, a clarification about that last point. Um, because you still have the log of the chi-squared divergence at the start in your bound, um, in what, what sense is this warm start assumption like weaker? Oh, um, you get a good point. Yes, sorry for that. I <laughs> take it back. So, I mean, so yeah, I think we should say that, I mean, we can work with this assumption and then you are right that the dependence here actually depends on D. Sorry for that. Okay, thank you. And I, I mean, for that, actually, I don't uh, exactly remember your bounds, so maybe we can compare that afterwards. Okay, so uh, now, I mean, given the uh, remaining time, uh, I think uh, I have like 15 minutes left or 10 minutes left. Uh, yeah, 11. 11, okay, 10 minutes. So uh, now I will actually talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, how we actually carry out the, uh, the analysis for the convergence rate. And the, actually the framework of the analysis are quite similar so that I'm, I'm going to uh, focus on the Langevin case. So uh, remember that for the Langevin case, what we need to do is to actually understand the convergence of the uh, PDE uh, with the initial condition given by that. And we know that this PDE will eventually goes to a, uh, goes to a constant, okay? And now the difficulty of this analysis uh, from a PDE point of view is that the operator L we have is not elliptic. And because we have something first order here and this is a rotation, it's not a diffusion. Okay, and this part is elliptic. And so uh, in more technical terms, this is known as the hypoelliptic equation, uh, hypoelliptic operator. And that's also I mean, why we call it hypocoercivity. And the reason is basically because you only have like I mean, first order derivative in X, but not second order derivative in X. You only have second order derivative in V direction. And as a result, if you hope for coercivity, uh, which in a sense is just as, as simple as following, so that if you take inner product with L2 of your generator with F, and if you do integration of parts in the, in, in the previous case, right? So that in the, in the overdamped case, what you will do is that if you take a integration of parts, I mean, for the generator of the overdamped over dynamics, and you can actually see that this is just a, by, uh, this is actually just the, the gradient square and the L2 norm of the gradient of G. Sorry. Okay. And then by concurrent inequality, you can use this to bond L2. So this is actually comes into the proof of the energy method. So you want to mimic the same thing here for this, uh, for the new uh, kinetic uh, Langevin equation. And what you can, you can follow the same line of the proof and then you can do inclusion of parts. But because, I mean, there was only actually the second order derivative in V and what you find is that this part of the generator 
because it's a full starter and it's actually canceled out in this intuition of parts. And so after intuition of parts, you only get the gradient, which is kind of you like, but that's only in the V direction. So there was no hope that this gradient in the V direction can bound the L2 norm because I mean, the function for example, can depend only on X so that the gradient vanishes while the L2 norm of course does not vanish. So this is the trouble that, I mean, preventing us by using the simple cohesivity estimate or the energy method to, uh, to prove the convergence. And to overcome that, the idea, which dates back to uh, Omander, and also uh, we, we sort of inspired by, by, by the work by uh, Chris Mura, uh, <coughs> John Christophe Mora and so Armstrong. And the idea is to actually, we need to augment the state space by also considering what's happening, uh, not at an instant time, but also uh, within a time duration from zero to T, okay? And so we consider the, uh, the augmented state space. So now it's not only X and V, but also we put in time T. And in that augmented time space, it's possible to establish a Poincaré inequality of this kind. So this is a Poincaré inequality that in the augmented time space, so that lambda here is the back measure and from the interval from zero to T and the mu is the uh, measure on the extended state space. And the, on the right hand side, we have the gradient uh, of V, which is what you expected from the uh, generator. But if you only use that term, there is no hope to control the left hand side. And in order to control left hand side, we also need the other part of the equation to help. Okay, so that this is the uh, this is a non-reversible part, non-reversible part of the dynamics in our equation. And using together these two that you are able to bound the L2, okay? And now if we are able to prove this inequality and the rest of the analysis actually just follows from a slightly modified energy estimate argument. So it's just because that if you write down how the L2 norm changes, remember that, I mean, our, all our analysis is chi-square or the L2. So, uh, this was actually the idea was borrowed from uh, the paper by Armstrong and Murat. And you can uh, rewrite that difference as a time integral of the gradient of F so that this is just followed from the equation, okay? Now, using the equation, we know that this thing can be rewritten, I mean, as part of that as the, uh, as the other parts of the equation, okay? So because we know that the equation is given by the time derivative times the Hamiltonian part is equal to fluctuation dissipation part, so that this, I mean, we can rewrite this thing, okay? Boundary field from below by the other parts of the equation in L2 norm. So now you just split this term into two parts. One is this, uh, keeping some part of the original and, I mean, and also uh, using the help from this term. And now using the Poincaré inequality that we can use the sum of these two terms to control the L2 norm. So that putting them together, you can, I mean, so this is split into two terms and putting them together, you can lower bound the, uh, the L2 norm or because we have an active sign that here that we upper bounded from the negative of the L2 norm, okay? So you get the exponential decay. And the rate, I mean, so for, to get the rate, you need to do some calculations to, to figure out what the exact rate is. And then, uh, by the way, for those of uh, the uh, people who are familiar with HMC, so the T, so the time duration that we need to take here is actually proportional to root one over, uh, to get the optimal rate. This is actually proportional to one over root of M. So which means that uh, for running the HMC algorithm, if you want to get a corresponding convergence rate, the deterministic Hamiltonian flow needs to be as long as that. Uh, but then the, prob uh, the problem is that, as far as I know, if you run the HMC, uh, the Hamiltonian dynamics for that time duration, it's very hard to establish a good coupling uh, contraction argument, so to get the uh, corresponding rate. So as, so, so far, I mean, uh, even though that this is suggesting this kind of time duration, uh, but on the level of coupling, we were not able to get the uh, convergence rate that is, uh, that is matching um, using the coupling method. Chen Feng, can I ask a quick question about this inequality? I'm a bit confused. So if I look at the, the right hand side of your first, so I'm in the big display. If I look at the right hand side of the first uh, row, and the left-hand side of the last row, it seems that you've proved again what you said you could not prove, that the square norm of uh, F is upper bounded by uh, uh, its, its, its gradient, which again, you know, if F depends only on X, this will be zero and so- Yeah, I'm this is, I mean, so there are two differences here. So first of all, this is actually over a time interval. So this is integrated over time. 
from zero to T. And also, I mean, this is not for a general uh, F, this is the F being a solution of our PDE, because I mean, we use in this inequality, we use the fact that F solves the uh, backward chemical off equation. Okay, all right, thank you. Price. And there is no hope if you want to prove this thing without the time augmented, so that, that will be simply false. <laughs> Uh, that term blows up. Yeah, exactly. So what, I mean, if I hear Lihan correctly is, I mean, what he was saying that if you send this T to zero, then, I mean, these constants blows up so that the, uh, the inequality is not valid. All right, thank you. Okay. So uh, I, I mean, to prove of the Pankara inequality, I mean, I don't think I have time to go over these things, but I mean, if you are interested, uh, you can talk to uh, me afterwards or maybe talk to Li Han. But the idea is actually not that difficult in the sense that, I mean, we just try to do some integration parts, but the most technical step is to find the rest, right test function to do the integration by parts. And for that one is a technical lemma. And so I'm, I'm going to skip that group, I think, here. So to leave some, uh, so this is the technical uh, uh, construction of test function that we need to make. And then after you construct a test function, that things just follows uh, from like usual PD arguments. Okay, so uh, with that, I think uh, I think it's a good time to stop and maybe leave some time for questions. So uh, I've discussed some of the quantitative analysis, but mostly on the continuous level uh, for these sampling dynamics that is long event. And I think it's kind of interesting to think more about these. Uh, PDMP sampling dynamics, is exact fancy particle samplers, and so on and so forth. And the, uh, I think there are many, many open questions. For example, I mean, what's the uh, optimal rate for the fancy particle sampler? Does that actually depend on dimension or not? I mean, remember that our rate has a root D, but um, it's not so clear to us whether that's sharp or not. And also, try to, I mean, so uh, we showed analysis of the, uh, of, uh, of under some warm start assumptions of the uh, zigzag sampler complexity, uh, but I mean, to some extent, I mean, the, uh, the assumption of the warmness is not as great. So whether it's possible to remove that. And in terms of rate, I mean, there was a, a kappa square dependence there, I mean, which I don't think is optimal. And I mean, so for them, how to improve that, uh, these I think will be very interesting directions if uh, people want to work on these. Okay, with that, I want to conclude. And if you want to read more, these papers are listed here. Thank you for your attention. I thank you for this great talk, uh, Jen Fire. Do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, let's start with uh, Sin Ho. Then I'll get to you. Hi. Um, could you comment on what are the difficulties of trying to do this like a uh, uh, time augmented version of like a log solve of inequality for this setting? Uh, yeah. So that's a very good question, and uh, I think many asked uh, us this question, and we also talked with a couple of very, uh, many people on this. So uh, one difficulty, I guess, is even to formulate what should be the inequality. And I mean, so that's uh, already a bit unclear. I mean, because I mean, here you need uh, terms like this to help. And then of course, I mean, if you think about log lift, then the most straightforward uh, guess, uh, conjecture would be that to replace this F by root, sorry, replace this F here by root, uh, root F and replace these Fs by root F. Uh, that doesn't seem to work as far as we can try to make it work. Um, but maybe that's, um, I mean, maybe there are some better ways to come up with uh, the right form of inequality and try to prove it. But I mean, yeah, so we are not, we do not really have much ideas how to do that. Just a naive question. Like what if, what if I keep the Fs the way they are and on the left-hand side, I, re I replace it with like the entropy of, of F squared? Uh, yeah, I think that's the equivalent way of writing uh, things. I see, okay, thank you. Yeah, one is the modify log of lift and one is log of lift. I mean, of course here, the left-hand side needs to be changed. I'm not meaning to control the L2 norm, I'm controlling F log F. Um, hi, Jian from the Sui Chen. Um, so, can, can see you hear you? me? I can hear you. <laughs> oh, right. So, so, so your analysis very much reminds me of this uh, hypercoercivity analysis for um, Velasco focal Planck equation. Yes. Um, so, but, but uh, um, they, they do require the support of uh, the, the support of X is basically the entire domain. Do you encounter the same difficulty? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, so here in our case, actually, we need uh, some kind of uh, gross assumptions of the, I mean, so uh, if I go back to uh, the, the main theorem. So I think you are kind of religious for the- You, you have one slide on that this, talks- So that right. you need actually you to okay. gross and then the hashing of you is not too crazy. So that, I mean, so in particular, I don't think uh, it would work if it's a compact support. Um, right. So, yeah, it's, it's a similar the, issue. Yeah. So I mean, by the way, this uh, this assumption actually also appears in Galani's uh, work of hypercoercivity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The the second question I have is um, the the pi minus identity that operator looks very much like the BGK operator. Yeah, that's why it's called kinetic Langevin equation. <laughs> okay. So so uh, there there are other collision operator that drives the uh, velocity domain back to Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about those? Um, I mean, we haven't tried, but I think, I mean, to some extent, I mean, from our analysis point of view, uh, the, uh, let me go back to here. So from our analysis point of view, if you use this, or if you use the, I mean, if you replace this by the, uh, what's happening in the Planck uh, equation, the fluctuating dissipation operator, actually they don't really affect the rate. So I think as long as the collision operator has a uniform spell, uh, gap, and then the gamma is, uh, is, I mean, you multiply it in front with the gamma parameter, I think the behavior will be uh, uh, all the same, except with some like absolute constant difference. Oh, I mean, because okay. we are doing two, I mean, in, in language of kinetic equation, we are already, I mean, actually showing the convergence rate for two kind of collision operator. One is uh, the Fokker-Planck collision and another is the BGK collision. Have you thought about Boltzmann? Uh, well, that makes things nonlinear, right? So that. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a particle system, so you have the interaction between particles. Yeah, just, we just haven't for... thought about it. I mean, so for linearized Boltzmann, I believe one can do something. For the nonlinear okay. one, I, I don't know. Okay. 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 Thank you. So we had a question over there. Hi, Jeff. Uh, this is Wole. Very nice talk and work as, as always. Uh, quick question. So um, you had both um, very nice results uh, at the continuous level and at the discrete level, and you talked about the proof um, for the continuous processes. And uh, can you say a few words about how do you bridge um, to, the, to the discrete results? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, I mean, the difficulty is that we're working in chi-square, right? So I mean, there are recent results that can uh, analyze the chi-square convergence for uh, for overdamp Langevin uh, discretized. Um, and I mean, so far we are not able to, I mean, so just the difficulty is to control the chi-square uh, error after do the discretization. And I mean, uh, so far we are not able to get very nice rates for these. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, I'm going to uh, stop here and thank Jeff Feng for a great talk that generated a lot of questions. Thank you.